Welcome to Better Life Today. I am pleased uh, to have Laren Cole with us today. And we have been tackling some of the hard questions that we're faced with um, as we talk about others. There are misconceptions. There are things maybe we're not even certain about um, from the biblical standpoint. And so we had planned, first of all, I want to welcome you. Thank, Thank you for you. being here with oh, us man. today. What a privilege. It is a blessing. We had actually planned on having you here for two programs, but we had so much to talk about and it's been so enjoyable that we wrangled you into a third one. So this has Great. become a three-part series where we again are tackling those questions that we've been wrestling with. Sometimes it's misconceptions people have about the church. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's conversations within the church where we don't have as much clarity as perhaps we could. And so we want to try to cut through that. We're going to be talking about some hard issues. Mm -hmm. And um, anytime we study the Bible, I think it's just a huge blessing to start by talking to Jesus about mm -hmm. it so that we are focused on that. So welcome, Laren. Thank you Thank for you. being here with us again. And would you start us with prayer? Sure. Dear Father in heaven, we ask again for the Spirit to be with us, guide us, Use our words and uh, put thoughts in our minds, put words in our mouth. Help us to be a blessing to those that view this program. And so we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And Laren, before we start, um, tell, tell us a little bit about where God has led you with your ministry and why you're focused on what you're focusing. Well, it's the everlasting gospel. I think uh, you look in Revelation 14 and you see this term everlasting gospel and you see three angels messages. These are the last messages that are to go to the world before Jesus comes, before mm -hmm. probation closes, time of trouble starts. This is it. And there's some urgent messages. And I feel, I just feel the urge, you know, to, um, to get involved with others who are doing the same thing and teach the book of Revelation and, you know, proclaim an urgent message to the world. Right. And so... So our, our ministry, Desire Media, is involved in, uh, we have a free online Bible school, which is called Revelation 101, survival training course. We actually have students now from 181 countries. Oh, praise God. And that's all due to our Google ads. Mm -hmm. And uh, praise the Lord, uh, we have been using social media and Google ads. And it brings people from all over the world, especially in India. India just dominates mm. uh, a lot, a big sh uh, share of our students and our, our people who visit our website. But... Um, all right. It's all in English. Everybody speaks English now. It's yeah. amazing. I, well, yeah, and there's translations. There's all kinds yeah. of things to help with that. So yeah. that, that's fantastic. So as you're uh, with that part of the ministry, why are you choosing these questions? What's the goal here to well, tackle these hard questions? Well, on our forum, if you go to our website and you see our Bible school, you'll see the, the, it's in the question and answer format. At the bottom of each uh, page, our question basically is a little question that says Qu your questions and people submit questions and uh, these are the most common questions I, I believe that um, we categorize them into 10 most common questions so okay. these are the questions that people struggle with they've learned often they'll learn the truth they'll see it in the Bible and then all of a sudden they'll hear something from somebody else and they go wait a minute what about that does it what does this mean and so and they and, and these are these they all come from basically the same sources Right. Same four sources. We mentioned the four sources. Mm -hmm. Challenges on the Sabbath, challenges on the state of the dead, challenges on dietary laws in the Bible, and challenges on the spirit of prophecy. And so I just sort of thought, well, let's make a whole series out of this and um, hopefully it can be a blessing. Right, right. And so in, I would, so our purpose, our purpose in the Seventh Adventist Church is to proclaim the three angels' messages. Right. Yeah. But sometimes people can't even get to that because they're blocked by right. getting answers to these questions that maybe are inaccurate yeah. or maybe not getting answers at all. Yeah, yeah it's the Satan's first lie in the Bible in Genesis uh, 3 was that uh, you will sh not surely die. And so we've dealt several on our last program, we dealt with the state of the dead. Mm -hmm. He's still perpetuating that. He's telling people, you don't really die when you die. You don't, 
uh, go to a grave and sleep. You know, you, go, you transition into heaven or to hell, but you don't die. The Bible teaches you die. Right. God said you die, and the devil, the devil has been perpetuating this and, and trying to bring that into Christian teaching. Well, and you look, you look around us, you look at the popular culture and right, now, right now, there's such a focus yeah. with the superheroes and all the, yeah. these other aspects that just is so oh, pervasive yeah. and it turns it into entertainment. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> wow. Yep. Well, so we're going to talk about some more tough questions Good. today. And the first one has to do with women. And that's one we'd like to kind of shy away from sometimes, yeah. like a lot of these. Yes. So here's the question, and this is based, I have two texts here. So as, as we're doing this, please grab your Bible mm -hmm. and look at these Definitely. with us. So we have two verses. One is 1 Corinthians 14, verses 34 and 35. And the other one comes from 1 Timothy 2, verses 11 and 12. And here's the question. Doesn't the Bible teach that women can't speak in church. How would you answer that? Okay, well, my first and my first response is unusual, but I would say the bigger question is, if it did teach that women don't, shouldn't speak in church, would we obey that? Mm. You know, our, is our job to uh, explain away the text and say, and to twist it to say, well, it really does say that they can speak, or is it, our, our job is really to discover what God is teaching through the Bible. So. Okay. So I like to, you know, as long as we're honest about this. Yeah, absolutely. And so the question is, uh, can a woman speak in church? Does the Bible teach that? Is Paul saying that? And the answer is, is no in general, but no and yes. First Corinthians 14, verse 34, it says, let your women, and that's important where it says, let your women keep silence in the churches. For it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience as also saith the law. That's important too, the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands, another important word, at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. So that's, that sounds like that's a, a That's dunk. awful strong, yeah. yeah. Women, be quiet, it's church time. Yeah. Men, go ahead and talk about women, that's, okay, so, so the, the, the subject of 1 Corinthians 14, we talked about context, right. we, gotta go, we gotta look at the context here, because this is a big deal. Um, the, the subject of 1 Corinthians 14 is, does anybody know? I guess we kind of know. That's, it's about confusion of tongues, speaking in tongues, and confusion in church services. Mm. These, these chapters have themes. 1 Corinthians 13 has a theme. That's the love chapter, right? 1 Corinthians 12 has a theme. It's uh, the, the use of the gift of the Spirit. So we get to 1 Corinthians 14, and it's about confusion of, uh, in the church service, and it's about tongues, or the misuse of the, of the gift of tongues and confusion in churches. So who is Paul addressing? Right off the bat, he said, let your women, if I said to Charlie, your, let your woman be silent in the church. Now, who am I talking to about? You'd be talking about my, my, my spouse. Yeah, your wife, that's your yeah. wife. So really, this could be translated, let your wives, let your wives keep silent in the churches, and it's not permitted for them to speak. Uh, but they're commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. So. Well, what's happening here in the church service, it's, it's confusion in the church. You know, people are speaking in tongues and he's saying, let's do this in order. Yeah, um, uh, so if you have, you have women on one side, basically, this is how they delineate the church. They usually have women on one side and men on the other side. And what was happening is to add to the confusion, women were asking their husbands about things that were happening in the church and they're talking out mm -hmm. loud. And so, they're, so Paul is appealing to the men to get control and help curb this confusion, because it's, it's adding to the confusion, all this talking in church. And so he says, uh, husbands, let your wives get, get, get them to be quiet, because it, it says here, they're commanded to be under obedience as also say at the law. So in those times, and, and there are a few countries today, women were commanded to obey their husbands. Mm -hmm. And did you know that there are 19 countries today that still have those laws on the books, that women are commanded to obey their husbands and can be censured, I think there's even the death penalty in Saudi Arabia, for uh, disobedience to your husband. They have mm -hmm. the right, and Paul, uh, Paul is appealing to them. He says, that's also say at the law. The law says you can do something about it. So he's this. speaking into that culture yeah. as it's, well. It sounds a little harsh because mm -hmm. we wouldn't ever try this in the United States, really, because, you know, we give women the suffrage thing and all. It's uh, women and men have equal rights and everything. But 
not in Saudi Arabia, not mm -hmm. in Iran, not in many, Yemen, Somalia, North Korea, I believe. There's countries where women are commanded, they're uh, under the law to be obedient to their husbands, and they can bring them to court if they're not. Paul is saying, come on, help with this confusion. If they want to learn anything, let them ask their husbands. So it's talking to the, the relationship between the wife and the husbands. Which in, in the picture you're painting here, that's what they were doing, but then that's followed with at home. Yeah. So yep. not, not saying don't have this yeah. communication, just don't do it right now yeah. because it's creating confusion. And that's a key point, at home. It's because mm -hmm. it's the confusion in the church. They're already having, they're struggling. The Corinthian church was really struggling. Every one of the chapters in 1 Corinthians is a rebuke to the church for doing something, misusing something. Like, for instance, the gift of tongues in 1 Corinthians 14. He's, he lets people know the gift of tongues is not for you people in the cloistered church. It's a, it's a sign for those that don't believe. Hmm. He says, then he mentions um, uh, prophecy. Now, that's a gift uh, for the church. The, uh, the prophetic gift is given so that the one prophet, the, the messenger, can edify just the church, not for the outsiders, but the gift of tongues speaking a foreign language, that's not for you guys. And if you're using it that way, it's, mis it's being misused anyway. Hmm. It's for those outside. Hmm. That's in 1 Corinthians 14. And so he's trying to curb the, um, the, um, the problem with the confusion in the church. And he just happens to mention the let your women keep silence in the churches. Because he says, I know that's one of the problems in our church is that they're talking back and forth and they're not, you know, men and women are not sitting together. 1 Timothy 2, he also says, but I suffer a, not a woman to teach, nor usurp authority over the man. And that means the husband, but to be in silence. So, so in other words, in the Christian home, the man is supposed to be the priest of the family, the Christian family. It doesn't mean that he's a despot, a despotic like leader, a, a tyrant, and he can tell her what to do. Because it also says, Paul also says, I think it's in Ephesians 5, Husbands, love your wives love as your Christ, wives, loves, as the Christ church, loves the church and yes. gave himself mm -hmm. for it. In other words, the, the, the Christian husband's duty is to actually lay down his life to save the woman. So he's got a high calling right off the bat. And then in return for that Christian loyalty and servitude, the woman is supposed to be, let the man be the man of the family and, uh, you know, the priest of the family and not be necessarily the, 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 the one who makes the decisions over, you know, the last word. That's in the Christian home. But it, it's not talking about women speaking in church. And so, and so uh, the Seventh-day Adventist church gets a lot of flack on this text because you have, uh, you know, Seventh-day Adventists have a woman leader in the church. And that's mm. not even true in itself because uh, the gift of prophecy through the, uh, the personage of Ellen White, she was never a leader in the church. She, was, she had what we believe is the prophetic gift. She was a messenger, would take messenger messages from to angels. to the church. And give it to that's not mm -hmm. that's not leadership. Her husband was the leader, he was the the general conference president, and he provided the leadership. And um, so it's um, but she had even a higher calling than that. She was a prophet. I mean, I believe she was right. inspired prophet. She was receiving messages and and relaying those to the church. Right. So we have a lot more to continue okay. with with this, but we need to take a quick break. Um, I appreciate you staying with us. I'm just a pleasure to have Larry and Cole here with us. And we're gonna talk about this more. We have one more question to tackle in the second half of our program. Please stay with us. Better Life Broadcasting is a viewer-supported Christian media ministry that offers streaming programming via apps on various devices. Please visit blbn.org to support Better Life or to get more information. And don't forget to like and subscribe. We are back uh, with Laren Cole. I want to thank you for being with us as we tackle some of those hard questions that we're faced with. And I'll, I'll be honest, I still struggle with some of these. So I'm, I'm grateful that you're here to kind of guide us through these a little bit. And as we learn together, uh, we are never, ever, ever done learning until Jesus never. comes. And then we're going to keep learning. Yeah. So praise, uh, the praise God for the ability we have to join together and study in context the word. So just wanted to, as we're, we've been talking about women mm -hmm. and speaking, and it sounded like there was kind of a prohibition on it, but it really wasn't. Mm -hmm. It's not a minimizing of the role that women play in our church, no. in society, and in our lives. Um, did you have any further thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah, it was just about what I mentioned earlier. It's the confusion in the church that Paul is trying to help the church out 
what's the confusion? The communication out mm -hmm. loud in church, and that can be done later, like you mentioned. It can be done at home. The wives and husbands can communicate about this at home. Uh, and so speaking of uh, prophets, you know, we have women uh, using their role in, uh, in ministry many places in the Bible. Miriam, for instance, mm. sister of Moses, was a prophetess. You know, that's a pretty high role. And she was, and she was considered one of the leaders. Yes, yeah, so she was a leader. Well. Yeah, she's, she's uh, mm -hmm. Moses' sister. Huldah in the Bible, you have her as a prophetess. Deborah was also a judge and a prophet. Um, and in the New Testament, Philip, his four daughters. Mm. Paul even mentions her. He's not, he's not saying women don't talk in church. Not, you know, as you're not, you're prohibited to be the uh, person to speak in church. Because here he, he just met uh, Philip. They stayed with him, and she, they had four daughters that were all prophets, he said. Mm. He said, this was amazing. Isaiah's wife, you know, Isaiah was a prophet. Isaiah's wife was a prophetess. And uh, so the, the gift of prophecy, which is sort of a leadership role, I guess you would say, is, um, is, a, is a, a female or male role. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, pa pastors is another story. I mean, we talk about, uh, Paul talks about a bishop being the husband of one wife. And, and so that's, that's, I know that's being debated a lot. But, um, you know, that's another subject, I guess. Right, right. All right, so we have, this is a big one for me because this is certainly something that the Adventist church is known for. So okay. we're, gonna, we're gonna switch gears a little and we're gonna talk about the Sabbath. All right. And this, this comes out of Colossians uh, chapter two, verses 14 through 17. And here's the question. Didn't the Sabbath end and get nailed to the cross? How would you respond to that? Now that is the number one challenge to Adventists they, uh, about the Sabbath and any Sabbath keeper. There's a lot of Sabbath keepers besides Adventists out mm -hmm. there. You know, there's a 510 denominated Sabbath keeping groups. Seventh-day Adventist Church is the largest of those 510, by far the largest. Uh, but it is the number one text used to challenge Adventists to say, look, the Sabbath was done, it's nailed to the cross. Because right here in Colossians 2, 14 through 17, it says, blotting out the handwriting Keyword. Of, just note that word if you're in your Bibles. Note the word handwriting of ordinances. Another keyword uh, that was against us. Another keyword which is contrary to us. Took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. So let no man therefore judge you in meat, which means food, or in drink, or in respect of a holy day, or the new moon, or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the bodies of Christ. So this is uh, the big misunderstanding is. There are two different Sabbaths in the Bible. Most Christians in the New Testament, don't, we, we don't really know that. There's two Sabbaths. There's the weekly Sabbath of the Ten Commandments, and then there's the annual Sabbaths. They're called feast days, ceremonial mm. Sabbaths. They're in Leviticus 23. And uh, that's the, conf the confusion is Paul's not talking about the weekly. He's talking about the annual, the, the yearly. They're called Sabbath days too. For instance, if you look up in Leviticus 23 and verse 24, the Bible says, in the seventh month, the first day of the, of the month, you shall have a Sabbath, just like you would have the seventh day Sabbath, but this is a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets. This was the Feast of Trumpets. Okay. It's called a Sabbath day. Paul's talking about these. He's talking about these ceremonial Sabbaths. Well, how do we know that? By those key words that we just mentioned, the word handwriting. That's a reference to the handwriting of Moses. In 2 Chron uh, Chronicles 35, verse 6, the Bible says, kill the Passover. That's an annual Sabbath. Kill the Passover according to the word of the Lord by the handwriting of Moses. Mm. He wrote those by his hand. The Ten Commandments was written by God's finger, not Moses' hand. It's etched in stone, not handwriting. The next word is blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. Ordinance, another reference to annual Sabbaths. Numbers 9.12 says, according to the ordinances of the Passover. Passover the annual Sabbath of Passover is an ordinance against us. Deuteronomy 31, it says, take this book of the law, put it in the side of the ark so it can be a witness against us. Mm -hmm. What was in the side of the ark? It's the, the Moses law written by his hand, all these ordinances. It was against, it doesn't mean against us, like contrary to, it means on the side of. Just physically. Yeah, right. it's physically against the, the ark. Ten commandments were in the ark. The law of Moses was in the side of the ark. And he said, put this, put this law, the ceremonial Sabbath, it's in the side of the ark. And then it's right there in the language of Colossians 2. And then lastly, the word shadows. 
uh, which are a shadow of things to come. Well, what Sabbath is he talking about? Hebrews 10.1, for the law having a shadow of good things to come can never by those sacrifices, which are they offered year by year. That's an annual Sabbath. Make the comers perfect. So if you reread Colossians 2 with all the understanding of, oh, it's got, it's, it's got 10 actually, 10 mm -hmm. uh, references to annual Sabbaths. You reread it, uh, blotting out the handwriting. Well, that's the handwriting. Oh, that's the ceremonial Sabbaths. Ordinances, ceremonial Sabbaths, Passover. Against us, it was in the side of the ark, nailing it to the cross. Well, you can't nail stone. You can nail Moses' paper, his parchment. Mm -hmm. uh, drink, meat, respect to a holy day, uh, a new moon. Those are all things com connected with what we call feast days. A ceremonial Sabbath were feast days. And they were a shadow of things to come. The, and the weekly Sabbath, the Ten Commandments, was a shadow of th something that was past. Memorial of creation. The shadow of things to come was Christ would be the fulfillment of the Passover lamb. Right, right. And so it's very obvious and very easy to understand when you realize there are two Sabbaths. Paul is not talking about the Fourth Commandment Sabbath. He's talking about the annual Sabbaths. And so, that, but that is a number one, that's the number one challenge. People are all told, well, look, it's nailed to the cross, you know? Right. The and, we, and he's they're right. It is nailed to the cross, mm -hmm. but not the weekly Sabbath. Right. And we take, you know, we've heard this, but there's a lot of people when this is the first time they've heard about it yeah. or they're looking at it from the outside, it takes some study. In fact, even now, I'm here writing notes because I want to go back and look at all of these references because yeah. we need to know what we believe and why and why it's the truth yeah. and make sure that, again, we have it clear so that we can communicate yeah. it clearly to others. There are people and preachers, you see them on YouTube or wherever, and they're telling them, well, Sabbath is gone. It's nailed to the cross. That's right, it was. This, <laughs> this annual Sabbaths were nailed. These things pointed to Christ. Mm -hmm. We don't sacrifice lambs anymore because those lambs pointed to Christ. Right. And Paul has to make this over and over. He makes the same point in Romans 14, Colossians 3, when, and people are confused. Well, the Sabbath's done away with law. No, the, the, the law that pointed forward to Christ was done. What dominated the, the uh, Christian or the, uh, the, the religious services of the people around the time of Christ was not keeping the Ten Commandments. They don't, they don't have to talk about that. That's a, that's a foundation. Right. But it was participating in the sacrifices participating in this, the annual Sabbath, the ceremonial feast days. Mm -hmm. That's what dominated their, their everything. And so to, Paul's trying to help them transition. We don't need those anymore. Yeah, it's time to move forward. It's yeah. fulfilled now. Let's move forward right. in Christ. Nailed to the cross. We don't, now, and it's hard to explain these because that dominated their, their whole mind and their whole thinking about religion. Let's sacrifice the lamb. Well, we don't need to do that. We don't? What do I do? How do I get forgiven? <laughs> right. Christ fulfilled that. He's died on the cross. Now you can come to him. Repent from your sins and confess your sins. And the promise is he will cleanse you. Amen. So we're, we are running up against the clock here. So I want to talk about question number nine that we have. Is the Lord's day really Sunday? And this is based on Revelation 1 verse 10. Yeah. So, so just flippantly, you hear preachers or, you know, Bible teachers on YouTube, wherever saying, well, it's the Lord's day. And they just assume it's Sunday. Well, the Bible doesn't say in Revelation 1.10. It just says, John writes, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. And people are using that to say, that's Sunday. See, we got a new day now. You know, it's Sunday uh, is the Lord's Day. Nowhere does it say that. It doesn't say it's Saturday either in that text. Mm -hmm. But they assume it's Sunday and they use that to say it's Sunday. And where does the, the assumption come from? Well, if you want to get into a deep study, it's uh, way back uh, in... Uh, I would say that the Council of Laodicea is the first time I saw it actually written, the, the, where Bishop Eusebius says that I, the things that were supposed to be kept on Saturday Sabbath, we have transferred those to Sunday, and they called it the Lord's Day. Right. And that's the first time I've seen it in writing. I've heard that before that they're trying to use the word Lord's Day to refer to Sunday, like, like Justin Martyr. It's just a rumor, I think. But uh, but that's that's not a biblical source. No. That's that's later. It's all, and there, in Bishop Eusebius in the Council of A to C is actually admitting that Saturday is the Sabbath. Well, we're changing it. We now. are changing it. And this, and let's be clear, this is, this is referencing the Catholic Church. Yeah, yeah. But, and they didn't call it the Catholic Church right. back then. It was the Roman Church, yeah. But the Bible teaches, you look at Matthew 12 and verse 8, the Son of Man, Jesus says, is Lord of the Sabbath day, right? So what day is the Lord's day? 
the Sabbath day. And then Isaiah 58, if you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, mm -hmm. the Lord's day, Sabbath. In the fourth commandment, Exodus chapter 20, it says the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. So if you really want to know what the Lord's day is, you look at these texts and you say, well, I guess it's Saturday. Sabbath, Saturday, the seventh day of the week is the Lord's day. Right. John is saying, I was in the spirit on Saturday, on Sabbath. And um, we just have got this confusion thing and people to use it to, to try to throw a, a monkey wrench into the truth. Right. I'm just so thankful that we, again, have this opportunity to come together and study these things. These are, these are hard foundational questions. Yeah, they are. And until we spend time studying them, we don't know why. And it's easy to get confused and it's easy to be part, in my opinion, part of the problem rather than part of the answer by not being really clear on context and everything else and, and how to how to study yeah. so we can move forward. And the Bible tells us to study to show ourselves rightly approved, uh, rightly dividing the word of truth. Mm -hmm. The Bereans, for instance, they, they search the scriptures to see, see if these things were so. And that's God's calling on us, on the Christian today, to search the scriptures and study them for yourself. Be guided by the Spirit, and the promise is He'll guide you into truth. Amen. Yeah. We've talked about 2 Peter 3.16. We've talked about 1 Peter 3.15. Um, sanctified, be ready. Um, don't twist the words. Yeah. And we yeah, are so privileged to live in a time where we get to physically open up the Word of God and study it with our friends within our communities. We don't know that this will, in fact, we know that this is not a freedom that will always be with us. So hold on to it, hold on to it now, hold on to Jesus. And if you have any questions at all, please call us. We'll have the words up on the screen so that you'll be able to contact Lauren. I just, I'm so glad that you're here with us today. Oh, me and glad to be here. study, study and be ready, read things in context. And we just ask that God blesses you in your journey. Have a wonderful day. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.